Saturday, January 16th, 2021, Monaco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Today, we're going to look at the fatal tendency to plunder. I'm going to reference The Law by Frederick Bastia. Before I start, though, I like to talk a little bit about uh, what I've been doing uh, yesterday. I watched a really interesting uh, movie. It's a classic. It's called The Ten Commandments. It was uh, produced in 1956. Director was Cecil B. DeMille, starring Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner. About Moses, a uh, really interesting story. I had seen the movie before, but uh, I think the uh, older you get, the more experiences you get. Uh, you look at things differently, so it's really great to watch this movie. Uh, I think uh, people would enjoy it. <laughs> and it will give you also an idea of what's happening today, I would say. And also uh, teach, teach people maybe a little bit about patience. And uh, if you watch the movie, uh, you will see what I mean. I don't want to get into the, the movie. It's three hours and 40 minutes. I did buy it from Amazon Prime. Uh, it's not free. I know what Amazon has been doing, but uh, I try to avoid them as much as possible. Anyway, um, I've been reading uh, in the last few days, or even the last months, really, to be honest, about all the uh, fiscal stimulus, all the uh, jobs programs, all the business support programs, not only in the United States, but here in the UK, how governments have been, or taxpayers really have been, uh, tapped out into helping themselves, right? Uh, taking from one group to give to the other. And I have to say, one thing I'm proud of is that uh, I've survived on my own. Uh, I'm not eligible to get any support because I'm self-employed. Uh, my uh, income did quite well in 2020, so I, was, I wasn't eligible to claim anything, and I don't feel bitter about it. I'm actually very happy that I can tell you that uh, I've actually paid tax and I haven't taken from, from you, the taxpayer. And uh, there's an old saying about two wrongs don't make a right, and I think that's what uh, the law in Bastia and the tendency, uh, the fatal tendency to plunder comes into play. Uh, and uh, yesterday, or a couple of days ago, actually, I saw this story in the FT. Premier League uh, rivals cry foul over Bank of England COVID loan scheme. For Americans and other people around the world, the Premier League is the top league in football in England. And uh, yes, it's football, not soccer. I know Americans call it soccer, but it's really uh, the original football. But um, yes, it just goes to show that uh, this tendency uh, for the state, for government to interfere in our, our private businesses create problems because the story here is that the top clubs, they're big enough to get loans from the Bank of England while the uh, clubs that are not uh, big enough in terms of revenues can't. And it's really ironic that one of the clubs here, for example, uh, Tottenham Hotspurs, uh, is owned by a Bahamas-based billionaire, uh, Joe Lewis. I've known about Joe, Joe Lewis for a long time. Uh, he, he's uh, originally from the UK, and uh, he made billions trading the foreign exchange market. And of course, he went to uh, Bahamas. Why? Well, because it's a tax uh, haven tax-free haven, offshore tax-free haven. So here's a guy who's uh, avoiding his taxes here in the UK, is going to live in the Bahamas, and he's getting money from the taxpayer to help support a, a club that he bought that is based in the UK. So there's a lot of things wrong uh, with this picture. There's a lot of things wrong as well. With other pictures, uh, today there's a story, Sunak, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, tailors budget to avoid job cuts. So there's all kinds of groups uh, trying to get their plunder right. 
And uh, one of them is business groups. They want the, the chancellor to keep the programs, to extend them <laughs> as he's been extending, furlough, uh, the loan support. And then there's also uh, labor, uh, the opposition, trying to extend uh, the 20 pounds a week extra of unis universal credit. That's basically the dough. So there's all these groups trying to plunder from each other. That's basically what it is. And it doesn't make either of them right. And uh, yes, I even read there's a footballer by the name of Marcus Rashford who's trying to uh, defend the universal uh, credit, this 20 pound a week. And he's on 10 million pounds a year. So, and his industry or sport is benefiting actually from the taxpayer. So it's all confused. So it is understandable uh, that the people at the bottom, the general public, want their plunder as well. And the same thing is going with the states. I don't have to talk about that. All the stimulus checks, of course, all the billions that uh, the corporate uh, chiefs and the 1% have benefited from. Uh, we know that uh, the billionaires got have gotten even uh, richer. Uh, for, since uh, the, the government stepped in. So first a little bit on Frederick Bastia, and I recommend you look at uh, a link that I'll put below in the description. It talks about Frederick Bastia. It's from the Mises.org uh, website. But uh, in the book it says, uh, the law, Frederick Bastia, it is impossible to introduce into society a greater change and a greater evil uh, than this, the conversion of the law into an instrument of plunder. So Bastia was born, I think, 1801. He died in 1850 in France. It says here, France of 1850 was in political turmoil. In the aftermath of the revolution of 1848, the tide of socialism was sweeping the nation. One man stood alone against the tide. The precocious son of a merchant Frederick Bastia devoured the writings of free trade economists such as Adam Smith and Jean-Baptiste Say. Rejecting the popular notions of his day, Bastia began to speak and write against ideas he believed were undermining natural harmonies of interest among men. First as an orator and essayist, later as a member of the Legislative Assembly, he became known for withering logic and devastating wit. He also became isolated politically. The struggle between left and right was for power and plunder, yet Bastiat believed that the only purpose of government was to guarantee individual rights and freedom. And this is uh, one of his most memorable epigrams. He said, the state is that great fiction by which everyone tries to live at the expense of everyone else. So I'll also leave a, a free PDF to this book uh, in the description. You might also want to buy this book. Uh, I, I'm not going to go through the whole book, of course, even though it's not a long book. But uh, I want to go through the beginning uh, and uh, put it into context of what's happening uh, today in our world, uh, especially uh, since, let's say, early last year, but it's actually been happening for many, many decades. So here we go. Let's go through the beginning part of the law. Uh, this is what uh, Bastia says here before he starts. The law perverted and the police powers of the state perverted along with it. The law, I say, not only turned from its proper purpose, but made to follow an entirely contrary purpose the law become the weapon of every kind of greed. Instead of checking crime, the law itself guilty of the evils it's supposed to punish. If this is true, it is a serious fact, and moral duty requires me to call the attention of my fellow citizens to it. So nowadays, uh, it's not only in France, it's everywhere around the world. Okay, let's start. Life is a gift from God. We hold from God the gift which includes all others. This gift is life, physical, intellectual, and moral life. But life cannot maintain itself alone. The creator of life has entrusted us 
with the responsibility of preserving, developing, and perfecting it. In order that we may accomplish this, he has provided us with a collection of marvelous faculties, and he has put us in the midst of a variety of natural resources. By the application of our faculties to these natural resources, we convert them into products and use them. The process is necessary in order that life may run its appointed course. Life, faculties, production, in other words, individuality, liberty, property, this is man. I guess you can put woman in it, but I mean, I think he means mankind, of course. And in spite of the cunning of artful political leaders, these three gifts from God precede all human legislation and are superior to it. So there you go. Uh, the gifts from God, as he's saying, precedes uh, legislation and uh, politicians, of course. Life, liberty, and property do not exist because men have made laws. On the contrary, it was the fact that life, liberty, and property existed beforehand that caused men to make laws in the first place. So what is the law? What then is law? It is the collective organization of the individual right to lawful defense. Each of us has a natural right from God to defend his person, liberty, and his property. There are three basic requirements of life, and the preservation of any of them is completely dependent upon the preservation of the other two. For what are our faculties but the extension of our individuality? And what is property but an extension of our faculties? If every person has the right to defend, even by force, his person, his liberty, and his property, then it follows that a group of men have the right to organize and support a common force to protect these rights constantly. Thus, the principle of collective right, its reason for existing, its lawfulness, is based on individual right. And the common force that protects this collective right cannot logically have any other purpose or any other mission than that for which it acts as a substitute. Thus, since an individual cannot lawfully use force against the person, liberty, or property of another individual, then the common force, for the same reason, cannot lawfully be used to destroy the person, liberty, or property of individual individuals or groups. Wow, <laughs> how much better the world would be if uh, every student was required to read this book, uh, but let's continue anyway. Such a perversion of force would be in both cases contrary to our premise. Force has been given to us to defend our own individual rights. Who will dare to say that force ha has given to us to destroy the equal rights of our brothers? Since no individual acting separately can lawfully use force to destroy the rights of others, does it not logically follow that the same principle also applies to the common force that is nothing more than the organized combination of the individual forces? If that is true, then nothing can be more evident than this. The law is the organization of the natural right of lawful defense. It is the substitution of a common force for individual forces. And this common force is to do only what the individual forces have a natural and lawful right to do, to protect persons, liberties, and properties, to maintain the right of each, and to cause justice to reign over us all, <laughs> not just the 1%, not just the uh, corporate uh, CEOs who are able to come back from abroad and not have to self-isolate, not people like Marcus Rashford who continue to plow their trade because they're supposedly elite or celebrity athletes, right? So let's continue anyway. I'm not finished. <laughs> I'm not going to go through the whole book, of course. Uh, a just and enduring government 
If a nation were founded on this basis, it seems to me that order would prevail among the people in thought as well as in deeds. It seems to me that such a nation would have the most simple, easy to accept, economical, limited, non-oppressive, just and enduring government imaginable, whatever its political form might be. Under such an administration, everyone would understand that he possessed all the privileges as well as all the responsibilities of his existence. No one would have any argument with governments provided that his person was respected, his labor was free, and the fruits of his labor were protected against all unjust attack. When successful, we would not have to thank the state for our success. And conversely, when unsuccessful, we would no more think of blaming the state for misfortune than would the farmers blame the state because of hail or frost. The state would be felt only by the invaluable blessings of safety provided by this concept of government. It can be further stated that thanks to the non-intervention of the state in private affairs, our wants and their satisfactions would develop themselves in a logical manner. We would not see poor families seeking literary instruction before they have bread. We would not see cities populated at the expense of rural districts, nor rural districts at the expense of, of cities. We would not see the great displacements of capital, labor, and population that are caused by legislative decisions. I mean, this is uh, very, very much applicable today. We're seeing, like, everywhere around the world, people trying to move away from the cities, going into the countryside or more into suburban areas. That's creating problems everywhere. Uh, and you look at uh, states like California where people are moving out and going to other states. The sources of our existence are made uncertain and precarious by these state-created displacements. And furthermore, these acts burden the government with increased responsibilities. So now we continue the complete perversion of the law. But unfortunately, law by no means confines itself to its proper functions. And when it has exceeded its proper functions, it has not done so merely in some inconsequential and debatable matters. The law has gone further than this. It has acted in direct opposition to its own purpose. The law has been used to destroy its own objective, which is protecting life, property, and the individual. It has been applied to annihilate the justice that it was supposed to maintain, uh, to limiting and destroying rights, which is, its real purpose was to respect. The law has placed the collective force at the disposal of the unscrupulous who wish, without risk, to exploit the person, liberty, and property of others. It has converted plunder into a right in order to protect plunder, and it has converted lawful defense into a crime in order to punish lawful defense. How has this perversion of the law been accomplished? And what have been the results? The law has been uh, perverted by the influence of two entirely different causes, stupid greed and false philanthropy. Let us speak of the first. So what is this first uh, influence? Well, a fatal tendency of mankind. Self-preservation and self-development are common aspirations among all people, and if everyone enjoyed the unrestricted use of his faculties and the free disposition of the fruits of his labor, social progress would be ceaseless, uninterrupted, and unfailing. But there's also another tendency that is common among people. When they can, they wish to live and prosper at the expense of others. This is no rash accusation 
nor does it come from a gloomy and uncharitable spirit. The annals of history bear witness to the truth of it. The incessant wars, mass migrations, religious persecutions, universal slavery, dishonesty in commerce, and monopolies. This fatal desire has its origin in the very nature of man, in that primitive, universal, insuppressible instinct that impels him to satisfy his desires with the least possible pain. So, yeah, very straightforward there. Um, property and plunder now. Man can live and satisfy his wants only by ceaseless labor, by the ceaseless application of his faculties to natural resources. This process is the origin of property, but it is also true that a man may live and satisfy his wants by seizing and consuming the products of the labor of others. <laughs> well, that's the uh, old saying about parasites, right? Uh, this process is the origin of plunder. Now, since man is naturally inclined to avoid pain, and since labor is pain in itself, it follows that man will resort to plunder whenever plunder is easier than work. History shows this quite clearly, and under these conditions, neither religion nor morality can stop it. Well, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this reminds us, of course, of what's happening today. People staying at home and getting paid to stay at home. Here in the UK, you've got the furlough scheme. You've got all kinds of schemes, right? In the US, you've got the checks coming in. Uh, you've got corporations getting help. Uh, so everyone is like uh, avoiding the pain. Uh, and uh, we've been avoiding the pain for a very long time, I would say, in general, of course, not you in particular I'm talking about. When then does the plunder stop? It stops when it becomes more painful and more dangerous than labor. It is evident then that the proper pur purpose of law is to use the power of its collective force to stop this fatal tendency to plunder instead of to work. All the measures of the law should protect property and punish plunder. But generally, the law is made by one man or one class of men. Well, we know uh, who's making the law right now, the top 1%, the big corporations, the globalists. And since law cannot operate without the sanction and support of a dominating force, this force must be entrusted to those who make the laws. This fact combined with a fatal tendency that exists in the heart of man to satisfy his wants with the least possible effort explains the almost universal perversion of the law. Thus, it is easy to understand how law, instead of checking injustice, becomes the invincible weapon of injustice. It is easy to understand why the law is used by the legislator to destroy, in varying degrees among the rest of the people, their personal independence by slavery, their liberty by oppression, and their property by plunder. This is done for the benefit of the person who makes the law and in proportion to the power that he holds. So the victims of lawful or legal plunder Men naturally rebel against the injustice of which they are victims. Thus, when plunder is organized by law for the profit of those who make the law, all the plundered classes try somehow to enter by peaceful or revolutionary means into making of laws. According to their degree of enlightenment, these plundered classes may propose one of two entirely different purposes when they attempt to attain political power. Either they may wish to stop lawful plunder, or they may wish to share in it. <laughs> and I would say, unfortunately, uh, that's what's happening today, and uh, very few people are actually calling for the stop of lawful plunder on both sides of the political spectrum, I would uh, add. There's very few exceptions, like Ron Paul, of course, 
Woe to the nation when this latter purpose prevails among the mass victims of lawful plunder when they in turn seize the power to make laws. So this is what I said in the beginning of the video, two wrongs don't make a right. But of course I can understand why uh, the plundered classes are angry and they want part of the pie, right? Until that happens, the few practice lawful plunder upon the many, a common practice where the right to participate in the making of law is limited to a few persons. But then participation in the making of law becomes universal and then men seek to balance their conflicting interests by universal plunder. Instead of rooting out the injustices found in society, they make these injustices general. As soon as the plundered classes gain political power, they establish a system of reprisals against other classes. They do not abolish legal plunder. This objective would demand more enlightenment than they possess. Instead, they emulate their evil predecessors by participating in this legal plunder, even though it is against their own interests. It is as if it were necessary before a reign of justice appears for everyone to suffer a cruel retribution, some for their evilness and some for their la lack of understanding. So that's why, unfortunately, I think things are not going to get better. Uh, don't listen to Wall Street or politicians. Politicians saying we're going to have the roaring 20s. We're going to have an economic recovery. I think there will be a, a, a heavy price to pay really in the next decade or so for all the uh, universal plunder. So I'm going to finish off here uh, this last section and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, call it a day. Uh, the results of legal plunder. It is impossible to introduce into society a greater change and a greater evil than this, the conversion of the law into an instrument of plunder. What are the consequences of such a perversion? It would require volumes to describe them all. Thus, we must content ourselves with pointing out the most striking. In the first place, it erases from everyone's conscience the distinction between justice and injustice. No society can exist unless the laws are respected to a certain degree. The safest way to make laws respected is to make them respectable. When law and morality contradict each other, the citizen has the cruel alternative of either losing his moral sense or losing his re respect for the law. The two evils are of equal consequence and it would be difficult for a person to choose between them. The nature of law is to maintain justice. This is so much the case that in the minds of the people, law and justice are one and the same thing. So this is quite uh, amazing because nowadays we've got all these new uh, so-called laws and regulations in place. And those people who oppose them are called selfish and uh, immoral or unjust, right? This belief is so widespread that many persons have erroneously held that things are just because law makes them so. Thus, in order to make plunder appear just and sacred to many consciences, it is only necessary for the law to decree and sanction it. Slavery, restrictions, and monopoly find defenders not only among those who profit from them, but among those who suffer from them. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed the subject of the fatal tendency to plunder. I think it's uh, more important than ever that we look into this subject, especially with what's going on today. And uh, as Bastia said, I think we're going into a period of universal plunder right now, and um, it's going to be tough. But uh, as long as you know that it's happening, hopefully it will help you protect yourself uh, and your family. And uh, so if you enjoyed this video, uh, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And uh, I wish you all a great weekend. Take care. Bye.